Hello, I'm Natasha from Natasha Smart Textiles. I'm a wet felter and I run wet felting workshops, tutorials and courses. Now in this festive felt wreath tutorial video, I'm going to show you how to make a felted Christmas wreath design like this one, uh, which you can display and hang as embroidery hoop art. And I've also got some ideas at the end how you can adapt this to make smaller hanging baubles for your Christmas tree. Now this is a great opportunity to use all those sparkly yarns and fibres that you might have in your stash but have avoided using for wet felting because they're non-feltable. Um, but in this tutorial, I'm gonna show you how to lock everything into your felt so it stays put, even these non-feltable type fibers and yarns. And this is definitely a more the merrier type project with our embellishments, so we really can throw as much festive sparkle at it uh, as we can. Now, fiber-wise, you can use any wool fiber you like for this project, so perhaps either merino wool tops or roving, which you'll find in every Christmassy color imaginable, uh, or wool bat fiber. Um, now, the layout is gonna be similar to my previous tutorial on how to embellish flat felt, where I showed you a merino wool tops layout. Um, I've linked that video below. It goes into full detail about the whole wet felting process and also the merino wool tops layout. So if you're planning on using merino tops, um, you might want to have a look at that video first. But for this tutorial, I'm going to use bat fibre to show you the difference in layout um, and also to show you that you can use bat fibre for more delicate wet felting projects. It doesn't have to just be used on hard wearing projects like um, bags and slippers. So that's what we're going to do in this video. This is quite a quick project, perhaps an hour and a half to two hours to actually make the felt and then maybe another hour or so making up the hoop art. As usual, I'll put all the measurements, uh, materials list and equipment in, in the description below this video. Any questions, please get in touch um, via comments below or social media. And obviously, if you enjoyed this video, then do please give it a like below and subscribe to my channel. So thank you for watching, Merry Christmas and happy felting. So let's start off looking at our wet felting tools. So this is pretty much my normal flat wet felting setup. So I've got an oilcloth tablecloth, which is on top of my table. And then we're gonna be working on a piece of bubble wrap. So I've got a rectangle, which is 100 by 50 centimeters or 40 by 20 inches. Um, and that will be folded. So the actual working area that we'll use will be 50 centimeters square or 20 inches square. Now I use small bubble bubble wrap and the smooth side up, uh, although I'm not sure it makes too much difference. Then we need our soapy water. Um, so I've got some standard uh, washing up liquid here. Any brand will be fine. It doesn't have to be this one. Uh, then I've got a warm water and a big squirt of the washing up liquid solution. Um, and I'm using a household cleaning spray bottle, which I've just repurposed for that. Then we need some sort of rubbing tool. Now you can just use your hand. Um, I've shown you in other tutorials where you can use some kind of dishcloth, uh, but actually these wooden rubbing tools or something similar are really lovely to use. This one's from Heartfelt Silks in the, in the US, um, and they really increase the surface area um, of your uh, just your hand alone when you're rubbing. So they're a really good um, sort of addition to your wet felting kit if you're doing, doing a lot. We also need some kind of rolling tool. So I've got a um, pool noodle or pool float here. So anything similar like that, a piece of insulation, um, sort of foam pipe, uh, a rolling pin, uh, something like that would be do, would do. Um, this one is a bit bigger than the 50 centimeters, so that's quite handy if it can be a bit of a, a longer one to match the size of the project. Um, then we're also going to need some other standard things like a pair of scissors, a tape measure, um, some scales, and a couple of towels. So either something like a tea towel uh, or a small hand towel will be fine. Next, let's look at our materials. Now you can see that I've raided my stash for anything remotely Christmas coloured or sparkly or anything with a sheen to it. So this is a great project for digging out all those sorts of speciality fibres and yarns that you might want to use. Um, so let's run through what I've got here. So starting with our essential wool fibre, um, I've got this lovely purple um, bat fibre that I'm going to use. Uh, now you can use either merino or any other type of wool tops or roving for this project, or bat fibre, they're interchangeable. Um, it really doesn't matter. Probably the more important thing is what colour you get um, because you want something bright and Christmassy. Um, merino is probably better for that because you've got lots and lots of colours to choose from. But obviously you can find um, 
back fibres in lovely colours too. So I'm using fin wool. There's about 30 grams here, just over an ounce. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do a bat fibre um, flat felting layout for this project. If you're going to use tops or roving, then you might want to have a look at my previous uh, tutorial on uh, how to make embellished flat felt uh, because that one uses merino wool tops. So, that, so I show you the, the layout for that there. Um, so I'll link that video below. So that's our wool fibre. Uh, I'm also going to use some uh, fibres with a bit of sheen to them. So I've got this lovely sari silk, uh, which uh, is really, really Christmassy uh, looking. Um, so that's a, a silk product. Um, I'm also going to use some viscose uh, fibres um, in, a, in a lovely green colour. Um, I've also got a couple of merino blend fibres. So these are merino, which is blended with um, uh, an angelina-like sparkly fibre, so a, a synthetic fibre. So this is um, merino blended with stellina. Um, so I've got a, a cream coloured one, which has got gold sparkle in it. And then I've got a, a sort of light green uh, merino with uh, green sparkle in it. Um, the both these two blends plus the sari silk came from World of Wool, who are uh, a UK uh, wool supplier, um, but they deliver worldwide. So that's some sparkly sheeny fibres. Then I've also got, which is really really Christmassy, uh, these tinsel yarns. Uh, this is a king coal chunky tinsel yarn. Comes in loads of very Christmassy colours. Um, it's really nice yarn actually, it feels really soft, uh, so it's not quite like normal tinsel which is a bit rougher, rougher. Um, but this is a, a soft knitting yarn. Um, so this is lovely stuff. Now of course these types of yarn are completely not feltable, they're made of um, you know, something, a, a man-made uh, substance, so these are uh, polyester and lurex. So they're not going to felt on their own. So. Um, part of what we're going to do in this project is uh, making sure that we um, lock the fibres in so that they will felt in, so that we can use um, uh, products like this uh, which are not feltable otherwise. So I've got some tinsel yarns. I've also got some other what you call sort of fancy yarns. Um, uh, so I've got this um, which I think is also probably polyestery with with some kind of gold sparkle in. Um, now this particular yarn, I think this is a sort of eyelash yarn, uh, and it's got these little ribbony bits um, actually, um, which are sort of along its its length. And um, that's quite nice for um, making a sort of wreath design, having the, the little ribbons that sort of um, uh, poke around the edge of the wreath. So I've got that one to use. I've got a, a red and pink eyelash yarn, again sparkly. Um, and also this um, different sort of yarn. This one's a sort of very thin um, gold, um, almost looks a bit like bunting sort of yarn. Um, so that's something else that I spied which I thought would work. So again, none of these are going to felt um, unless we lock the fibres in. Um, but for a project like this, we actually can, can include them. Um, uh, so I've also got some of my sort of trusty wool yarns, which are very feltable. These are all mohair. This one's a, a slubby yarn, uh, and then these are mohair loop yarns. So these will definitely felt in. Um, so we'll be, be using those as well, uh, but again, in nice Christmassy colours. So in terms of amounts for all the, the other um, sort of embellishment materials, you're only talking about a couple of grams of each of these um, fibres uh, and then probably, well, between one and three metres, so up to sort of 120 inches uh, of these other yarns. So you don't need very much uh, for this project, but it is nice to have um, a bit of a, a collection to choose from this is definitely a sort of more is more project, so uh, we can throw quite a lot of this sparkly stuff up on it, um, and um, and it sort of all adds to the uh, the texture and the uh, the design, I think, uh, and the Christmas sparkliness. So here are the bits of equipment and materials we need for making up our hoop wreath. 
Um, obviously we'll come back to these later after we've actually made our felt, uh, but it's quite helpful to start with in particular to see the hoop and the hoop size um, because that gives an indication of the size of the felt that, that we're making and, the, and that we need. Um, so starting with the hoop, this is a 26 and a half centimetre um, diameter or 10 and a half inches um, hoop. Um, that's the outside measurement. Inside measurement is 25 centimetres or uh, 10 inches. So depending on how you measure it. Um, this is a bamboo hoop, but um, you can get other types of wood or plastic ones. Um, and these are quite easily available from, from craft and hobby stores or online. Now they'll always come with some kind of screw at the top, which is how you actually um, keep your finished piece in place. Now some of them just screw with your fingers Others like this one actually have a, a, a screw head. So you will need, if you've got one of those, a um, corresponding screwdriver to uh, tighten up the, the screws. So that's our hoop. We're also going to need um, an iron and an ironing board to neaten up our felt before we use it. We'll want some large scissors for cutting out our felt, as well as a tape measure or a ruler for um, making sure that we cut the right excess amount of, of felt off before we put it in the hoop. Um, we're also gonna need some kind of glue. I'm using a glue gun for securing the felt within the embroidery hoop. Um, now obviously glue guns get very hot, so I'm also using a heat resistant uh, work surface. So I've got a self-healing cutting mat here. Um, to you. So something like that is helpful if you're doing anything uh, with, with a glue gun because they do get quite hot and the glue does tend to drip. Um, so those are the sort of bits of tools for actually getting our felt in the hoop. Uh, then our final flourish with the hoop is to add um, first of all a bow uh, and I've got this wire edged ribbon uh, which is rather lovely stuff. Um, now this has got uh, very thin wire going down the sort of each side edge of the ribbon, um, but it means that you can kind of create a shape that will actually hold. It's got a bit more structure to it than normal ribbon has. So we can create a bow with that uh, and then attach that to, uh, to our, our felt wreath. Uh, so the, the ribbon that I'm using here is, it's two and a half centimeters or an inch wide, and you're gonna need a 50 centimeter or 20 inch length of it. Um, I've got a few here to choose from. I'm not sure which one I'll eventually use, but um, uh, you can find lots of really nice sparkly ones, especially at the moment. We'll also need something to secure the bow once we've made it to the felt. Now you could use your glue gun or glue. Um, I'm actually gonna do it with um, a needle and thread. So I've got some um, matching uh, embroidery thread, which matches the color of the felt. Uh, so that's for attaching the bow. And then the very final thing is some sort of hanging cord or um, you could use normal ribbon for this. I've got this sort of sparkly twine um, cord uh, so that we can actually hang up um, our embroidery hoop once it's finished. So you'll need a 35 centimeter or 14 inch length of that. So the first thing we're going to do is lay out our wool fiber. So I've got my background ready with my bubble wrap opened out smooth side up. I've got a tape measure laid out so I can check the size and we're going to lay out um, a layer of the fibre in a 50 by 50 centimetre square. Um, now with bat fibre, um, as with merino, it's always better to have more thinner layers um, in your fibre layout than fewer big thick layers. Um, it just helps with the bonding, helps with things like evenness. Um, now what we're going to do um, is sort of do a, a patchwork of um, pieces of the bat fiber uh, to create and build up our, our square shape. So with bat fiber you can just peel it apart and um, to use it. I've actually already peeled these apart a little bit um, and we can just lay them out. Helpfully this one I think is already about 50 centimeters in one direction but clearly not in the other direction so we're going to have to sort of patchwork uh, together pieces um, now for peeling apart the layers if you just take the full thickness of it um, and gently sort of grab either side you'll find that they do peel apart 
in nice neat layers quite helpfully. So now we want to make sure that, that everything is even. So I'm just going to get my size, overall sort of size right, which I think probably there-ish. And then I'm going to use this other piece to infill to create the right size. Now the thing with this project is that we actually want a relatively thin layer of felt because if it's too thick uh, you'll have trouble getting it into the embroidery hoop um, because it will just be too thick for it. Just pulling out some interesting organic matter there. Um, so although you want um, obviously an end result that uh, has got the right structure to it and is thick enough to hold together and hasn't got holes and thin parts. Um, there's a bit of a balance there about making it too thick um, and then you're struggling with the embroidery hoop. So a sort of rule by the end is that you don't want to be seeing your work surface underneath and um, that sort of pretty much means you've got a decent enough thickness but it's not too thick. So if this were merino I was laying out, I think I would probably just go for two alternating layers. Um, with this bat fibre, I'm really just sort of going for one sort of piece or patchwork together. So I can see I've got some slightly thinner bits, so just gonna spread out some wispy pieces and sort of fill those in. So obviously your hands and your eyes are a great tool here for being able to see and by gently patting feel where you've got thinner bits. Oh look, it's a bit thinner there. So keep playing about, wisping out, thinning out, infilling your fibre until you're happy that you've got a nice even layer. Uh, of the fiber. So bat layout can be really really quick um, compared to the merino tops where you're having to be very precise. In actual fact bat fiber, fiber can be uh, quite a forgiving way of laying out your fiber and much quicker. So that I think uh, is done. Then we're going to start on our embellishments. Obviously I had a whole host of things that we could use um, so and I'm probably going to try and use all of them because definitely more is more here I think. Um, so I'm going to layer up all sorts of different things and just sort of work up uh, a design that I'm happy with. So I'm going to start with this lovely sari silk because that's so Christmassy and what I want to do to start with is set the circular wreath shape and get the size of that right uh, because there is also obviously I've practiced and sort of created an optimum size for the reef to fit nicely into a hoop. So um, I want to sort of set the size size first, uh, just using this quite fine fibre, and then we can play about with some of our sparkly stuff. Um, now with the sari silk, actually you don't need lots uh, because we want a very fine wispy layer of it. Um, so if we spread it, spread it right out, you see you can actually get quite a lot of coverage from something like this by spreading it out. And it works better, like all fibres do, when you've got a fluffed out, wispy um, sort of layer of fibre rather than lumpy bits, because you're just giving the wool fibres a harder job of having to try and get through all of this um, to felt successfully. So I'm going to wisp this out. Um, naturally I think perhaps it is still a little bit a uh, bit thick in terms of or wide in terms of the circle I want to create so I'm gonna just tear it down. You'll see this sari silk and other sorts of speciality fibres you can buy also come in tops form or tops or roving. 
so you can kind of peel off a strip um, I'm certainly going to do that to make a circle it's quite nice to have a a complete strip going round rather than keep putting um, separate wispy pieces it sort of gives a bit more continuity so that's what I'm going to aim for so I will fluff this out and then place it in a, a sort of circular pattern so that's my sari silk all wisped out and I've just been laying it down trying to create a circle with it and obviously you want to go as centrally um, as you can within the piece of bat fiber now just before I I've obviously got too much here so before I um, reduce that I just want to check size wise now we're aiming for around um, 27 centimeters or 10 and a half inches in diameter for our circle so 27 going across overall that's about 28 that's fine and the central hole um, being about 12 and a half centimeters okay so that could be slightly bigger okay so we're in the right ballpark so I've got some extra here which I think I can reduce a bit and then I can work the ends around to kind of create a circle so let's move on to some sparkly stuff so I think I'm going to start with some of the green tinsel so I'm going to do I kind of want to edge the the wreath so I'm going to go right around the edge because again that whole idea of you know bits coming off the edge and poking out and you know with this tinsel um, it uh, you know you'll have have bits of it just sort of appearing and disappearing and that all sort of adds to the interest so I've done a around the edge the outer edge so now I'm going to go around the inner edge as well so that's the green tinsel now you remember I talked about this um, eyelash yarn that's got this sort of little ribbons going along it which I think is really good for a sort of wreath design because wreaths do have lots of little bits and pieces um, kind of coming off the edges so this is another one that I'm going to put right around the edge and hopefully try and get some of these little ribbons sticking off the edge as well I think they'll be rather nice when they're sort of attached and almost with something like that doesn't matter whether they're felted or not so long as the main strand is felted in you can have these little extra embellishments like these little ribbons all poking off the edge and they'll stay put but just again give a little bit of added interest and uh, some sort of movement to, to the design so that's some plenty of green that we've put in there it feels a little bit dark so I think it's time for some gold in here so I'm going to just go around a couple of times I think with this gold and you'll see I'm making all of the sort of lines of yarn wiggly to fill the space a bit more and also because in felting wiggly lines um, of whatever sort of yarn you use um, tend to felt in more more easily tight straight lines um, sometimes struggle or the wool fibers some, sometimes struggle to bond with them so keeping things nice and slack um, just helps with uh, the wool fibers bonding to everything so what I'm going to do because we've already got now um, several of these non feltable yarns so I'm going to put a fine layer of our gold merino blend uh, on top of these now the idea is that this is um, wool fiber so this is very feltable stuff 
if we put a fine layer on top um, now, whilst we can, um, whilst this fibre isn't too far away from the um, purple background fibre, then the fibres of both, once we start felting, will be able to migrate through this pile of tinsel uh, and silk to grab each other. So the idea is that by putting a fine layer of um, another fibre on top now, top now, importantly a wool fibre, uh, we're going to get those sets of fibre, the one on top and the one underneath, to bond together. They'll be able to um, migrate through all this and grab each other and that will then sandwich in all of our non-feltable stuff. So that's what we're going to do. Now the slight art here really is um, we want to bond all these fibres together but we don't want to completely obliterate um, uh, all of our sparkly yarn. So it's a bit of a balance of having a, a fine layer of this locking in fibre um, but also enough that it will actually then keep those non-feltable yarns in place. So in the same way as I did with the sari silk, I'm just going to sort of peel off a long strip, fluff that out and then lay that on top of our, our pile of festive stuff. So I've spent a bit of time there just fluffing out that um, sparkly gold blend merino and making sure that I get it up to the edges because for for instance a piece of tinsel there that's on the edge it's not going to um, felt down unless we get some fibre on top of it so I've kind of gone right around the edge but obviously like the little ribbon bits um, and the actual tinsel that's strands that are coming off the main sort of strand of the yarn they can be free because so long as they're attached in the main then those sort of little extra bits coming off the main strand um, can be free it doesn't matter if they don't lock in uh, if the main part of the yarn is locked in and as I say it is a bit of a balance of not wanting to cover everything up but having enough fiber there to help with that locking in of all these synthetic yarns which won't otherwise felt. Okay so you can still see the tinsel and everything underneath and once it's all felted together and these fibres have all started migrating through the yarns to bond with this they won't be it won't be quite as obvious as this although we are then of course now going to add even more um, sparkly stuff on top so um, it will be as I say interesting to see what we can actually see and what pokes through at the end. So that's our bit of locking in extra merino fibre that we've we've put on. So now I'm going to put some more sparkly things in. I'm sort of feeling a bit of a lack of red going on here. So and obviously red is such a Christmassy colour. So I'm going to use this very hairy tinsley yarn. Um, these eyelash yarns are quite good, although they're synthetic is very hairy and hairiness always helps with um, with felting you know it, it sort of gives the fibers uh, the wool fibers something more to grab hold of so I'm gonna perhaps put this slightly inside of the main outside line and I'll do the same on the inner edge as well okay that's a good splash of red going on I think we haven't used this one, so we could put this one on. This is the very fine gold yarn. And I think perhaps some more gold tinsel. Okay, that's looking pretty Christmassy. Um, let's try, I've got some green viscose fibres. We might just put a few wisps of. This is very like the sari silk, so it's um, produced in um, this tops form. And again, 
we just want to spread out the fibres to make them very wispy. And just like the sari silk, viscose fibres, again, don't have feltable properties, but they will bond really effectively. They're very fine, they're very um, sort of hairy, so it's, it's very easy for the wool fibres to bond with them. And they're nice for adding a bit of extra sort of sheen in whatever you're doing. So I'm just going to have a very delicate sort of layer here going over. So it's all just building up a nice pleasing looking uh, sort of design and, and colours. Perhaps I'll add some wool yarns now. So they'll be on the kind of top of the pile which will be very feltable. I'm going to use the green sparkly merino blend as a very top layer over everything. And I almost don't need to do it over the wool yarns because they will felt in um, quite happily but I think as we've got such a pile of stuff here I'm going to put on that final green sparkly merino blend as a top layer just to give everything a helping hand um, because there's so much here. Okay, I still couldn't resist putting more of this tinsel and eyelash stuff on, um, but I think I'm happy with that. So I'm going to add, again, as a final layer of locking in some of the green merino sparkly blend. So I'll do that in exactly the same way as I did before. So that's our fibre and embellishment layout complete with that final wispy layer of the green sparkly merino blend that we put on top to lock everything in place. And now's the time if you needed to make any kind of adjustments, wisping out the fibres a bit more to cover another bit of yarn or something, for instance, um, now's the time to do it. Um, but once you're happy, um, then we're going to um, start getting everything wet and soapy. So I've got my spray bottle. I've already started to, um, from ab above, just gently spray down to sort of push down in place all of our embellishments. Apologies for this very noisy spray bottle. And um, doing it sort of from above, you know, with this fairly gentle spray, um, just helps sort of to sink things down in place um, and not disrupt it all too much. But you can see the uh, me starting to soak the fibres kind of brings all the colour back because um, that wispy top layer um, is sort of blending down more into the pile of fibres. So you can you can see that even though it looks a little bit like we were um, covering all the embellishments up with that final layer of of wispy fibre. Um, actually it is very very fine so it will kind of blend in with everything else and disappear so you're not going to lose all your embellishments um, by adding that on the top and hopefully it will help keep everything in place. So once I've sort of flattened down the embellishments I can then get a bit more water on so I'm going to spray all over And this is where you could use um, a sort of heavier spray, like maybe a, a, a ball browser, which gives you a bit more of a, a sort of shower of, um, of water coming out. I've just got the spray bottle to hand, so that's all I'm going to use. So I'm just spraying it on the fibre to get the the fibre completely soaked. And what I'm going to do first of all is flatten everything down and then turn it over and spray on the other side um, and perhaps actually pour some water on to make sure that we've got a good amount of water in here. 
So the consistency that we're after with this whole soaking process um, is soaked through and very wet, but obviously we don't need um, water to be absolutely pouring everywhere and, and dripping all over the, the table. Um, so I'm just going to uh, pull back the bubble wrap. Just gently use my hands to flatten down the fibre and start to disperse the water a bit. Now there isn't enough water in here yet, I can see that, but I'm just flattening it. Okay, and then I'm going to fold or turn the package over. This is where bubble wrap as a as a surface to work in is really handy because it makes everything uh, manoeuvrable once you've got your delicate fibre sandwiched in it. I'm going to open that up and as you can see that's still quite quite dry so that will a good spray. And because there's no pattern on this side that I need to worry about disrupting, um, another thing that you can do is very gently pour water directly on. Now you can see how it sort of flattens things in quite a harsh manner when you pour water on directly. So I wouldn't do this on the front, um, but actually um, to do it on the back where we're not upsetting anything. Uh, works okay. So, okay, so that's more watering. So let's see if that's enough. So again, just gently flattening everything, and you can kind of see how the water is soaking through. So now I've flattened the fibre with my hands. Um, I'm just going to use the rubbing tool uh, as that's a really good surface um, for flattening down the fibre and obviously starting to rub it, which is what we've got to do next. So I'm just going to spray the bottom of it as that helps it rub across the bubble wrap much better. And just rub it across just gently. Again, what I'm trying to do really here is make sure that the water is all dispersed first um, through the, uh, the layers of all the wool fibre and into the, all those embellishments. Now before I turn it over and start rubbing from the front, um, I just wanted to say a word about edges. Now, we don't actually need to worry too much about having nice neat edges here because we're actually just going to be cutting away the excess felt um, once we've made it um, because we only need a, a circle of it for creating our, our hoop, our wreath design. Um, but if you were bothered about having neat edges, then a really easy way using bubble wrap is just to use the bubble wrap to lift up the very wispy edges of your um, sort of laid out fibre. Press down. So I'm folding the fibre along the edge, but using the bubble wrap to create a nice straight fold then peel back the bubble wrap and you've got a lovely straight edge there. So I'll do that again over here. So you're just folding the bubble wrap and the edge of the fibre at the same time. Press along it and then peel the bubble wrap back. And obviously I'm folding onto the reverse um, so that any overlap uh, is, on the, is on the reverse of the piece. So I'm going to fold back the bubble wrap 
I'll give this reverse side a little bit of a rub again, just along the edges, just where I've created those folds. So I'm going to turn back to the front, although I could easily stay on, on the back, it doesn't make too much difference. We now need to start rubbing our fibre and embellishment uh, package in earnest really. So I'm probably going to spend about 15-20 minutes rubbing both the front side and the reverse, we'll turn it over again, through the bubble wrap because that's kind of largely helping to protect the design and keep it in place. Um, so just, let me give that a spray again to help it. So this is the first stage of the actual felting process. We're starting to agitate all these fibres, which is what's going to help them bond together. And so I'm just going to rub the, the tool as evenly as I can all over the fibre. Um, i say I'll probably do 10 minutes on this side, perhaps 10 on the other side, and we'll see where we are once, uh, once I've done that and see whether things are starting to bond. Okay, so that was just under 20 minutes uh, of rubbing on both sides, and um, you can see how how good and soapy everything has got, uh, which is a good thing. If you end up with too much soap and there are suds everywhere, then just use your tea towel to soak some of it up. Um, but you do need a certain amount of soapiness and a good soaked through wetness to make the fibres uh, you know, start to, to do what they need to do and bond together. Um, and the soap makes it easier as well for you to, to do things like you know rub your hands um, you know, against the fibre to help with the agitation. Uh, it just sort of smooths the process of you being able to do that. So I'm just checking to see how much movement we've got. Um, there is still movement of fibres, but um, you know, in some areas it's, it's kind of locking in place nicely um, already. So I'm just gonna spend a bit of time, so maybe another five or so minutes rubbing gently um, with both hands on the, uh, mainly around my fibre, so the, the wreath circle, because I think in actual fact the, um, the sort of background fibre is looking um, pretty bonded already, so that's pretty good. So it really is just this pile of embellishments um, that we need to focus on. And as I've said, we are giving the wall fibre quite a hard job in having to get through all of this. Um, so just some gentle rubbing directly with your hands uh, is, is, a, is a good idea as sort of the next stage of agitation because we're now directly handling the fibres. So I've been rubbing the fibre directly with my hands for sort of five to ten minutes now um, and in some areas it's feeling um, very sort of well well locked in and not much is moving. Um, in others there's a bit more movement but in natural fact so long as the bulk um, is starting to, to bond together then we can move on because we would be here forever if we were trying to um, lock or lock everything in from this um, quite large pile of different embellishments so so long as everything is um, you know mostly sort of staying put then we can safely move on to increasing our level of agitation by starting to roll the um, our fibre package. So we're still in the felting stage at the moment, we're still at the point where we're just trying to get everything bonding together successfully. So increasing our agitation whilst also being a bit hands off, um, which we, we can do through through rolling the fibre, um, that's, that's quite a good way of doing it. So I'm going to sandwich the fibre back in the bubble wrap. And I've got my rolling tool, so I'm going to roll up the whole package around my pool float. And then to help with the grip, I like to wrap everything up in a tea towel, it sort of keeps the package together and helps you keep hold of it. I 
So what we're going to do is a sort of fairly standard felting recipe of rolling the fibre where you've got a, um, a square or rectangular piece on all four compass point edges for 100 rolls each edge. And that just um, helps to ensure that we're felting kind of evenly um, across the whole piece um, by doing an even amount of rolls on each of the four sides. So I'm going to start off, um, one roll is sort of out and back again, so we're going to do 100 rolls on this side, uh, then we'll unwrap it uh, and turn it 90 degrees and repeat until we've done all four sides. So I shall speed that up. So that was 400 rolls, 100 on each of the four sides, and I'm back to the beginning again. So we'll just have a little check, see how things are doing. Yeah, pretty good. Things seem to be flattening down into position quite nicely. Okay, so just to continue this agitation, we're going to turn it over and do exactly the same on the reverse. So it'll be another 400 uh, rolls. So I shall get on with that and come back to you when it's done. So that's my 800 rolls done. Turn it back to the front. Um, and let's have a look and see how everything's looking. So generally now, things should be quite well felted, as in this first stage of felting, which is where we're bonding all the fibres together and getting them to lock together. So yeah, that's pretty good. Now, if there was lots and lots of movement still, um, then I'd be inclined to carry on either with rubbing or with rolling um, to sort of give it that extra bit of agitation. Um, the thing is that once um, we move on to the next stage, which is actually where we start fulling and shrinking the um, what's now becoming felt, um, if you've got things that are loose or holes, everything starts to get bigger um, or loose things start to just come up, come away even more um, once you start um, doing things like throwing the felt around. So um, if you've got any bits that, that feel loose, it's worth spending a bit of extra time just giving them a rub before you move on to the very high level of agitation that you deploy during the, the, the fulling and shrink, fulling shrinking stage. Um, but that's pretty good. I've kind of got a and some the odd loose bit um, but as the rest of it is um, is adhered it just means that we might have sort of little bits that loop off um, of our of our final wreath so uh, an actual fact that sort of texture you know you would expect that in a, in a wreath so um, I'm going to leave that and see how that goes as I said we can always add in a couple of stitches if we need to secure anything um, by the end but on the whole, things are staying pretty well put. So I think I'm going to carry on to doing some uh, fulling now, uh, which we're going to do by basically loosely picking up the felt and throwing it on the table. So we'll probably end up doing this at least 300, 350 times. Um, and we'll see how it goes as to whether we need to do it more or less. Um, we can use our, our hoop as a bit of a guideline to, to check whether things are shrinking to the right sort of size. Um, so we'll keep an eye on it. Um, what I tend to do with, uh, with fulling is sort of throw in um, blocks of 50 or 100 so that you throw 50, then have a little look, see how things are going. Because it enables you to make adjustments. If you did the whole 300 or 400 in one go, um, you might find that things had started to uh, shrink up or fold up, crease up weird, in weird directions and things like that. So it's always worth checking uh, as you go along. So, um, so I'm going to start to throw it, but I can also feel at this point that this felt is, or pre-felt as it is now, is very, very sodden with, you can see, uh, with soap. So I'm actually going to um, give it a little, uh, just a squeeze in the sink first. Um, so that 
I'm not um, throwing soapy water mostly over myself as I as I throw this so uh, let me just go and do that um, I don't want to lose all of the water in it because you need water in it still at this stage um, for fulling um, but there's a balance to be had um, between how much is there so let me just sort that out so I haven't rinsed the felt all I've done is give it a squeeze in the sink just to get rid of some of the soapiness but there's still plenty in there just not quite so much okay so now to throw it I'm just going to loosely pick it up um, and throw it down on the on the table uh, in groups of 50 so that's 350 throws hopefully you can see how much it's shrunk already and really developing that sort of what I call crocodile skin texture uh, which shows that all the fibers are um, bonded and then starting to to grab each other tighter and tighter and compact together so we could certainly stop it there we've got lots of really nice crinkling of the um, embellishments going on which is what gives it the lovely sort of texture and you can see we're starting to go quite 3d uh, the wrinkling up of, of all those yarns and kind of pushing out of um, certain bits of yarns okay so let's do the acid test and see whether our hoop is the right size so this is the one I was planning um, now that's right kind of that's not bad it's right on the edges um, of the the hoop meeting the outer circle so I wonder if it could just do with being slightly smaller just to have a bit more of the background showing around the the outer edges of the hoop so I'm going to give it another 50 throws just to help shrink it just slightly more so that was another 50 we'll see what that looks like against the hoop the uh, the filling stage when you're doing things like um, throwing really happens very quickly I mean this is just a few minutes really that this has taken to get this shrinking down so let's have another look yeah I feel like there's a bit more of a border now just just a slight border um, around our piece now I like to always save a little bit of shrinkage for um, for the rinsing and um, drying in a towel process so um, I'm going to stop there with the throwing uh, so that's had 400 throws and I'm just going to give it a rinse roll it up in a towel to sort of towel dry it and then we'll have a look and see how it's looking so I've dried off my work surface and got a clean tea towel just for wrapping the felt up in to dry it off a little um, now when you're rinsing felt um, avoid wringing it because remember felt is wool and is stretchy so um, you can easily kind of wring things out of shape so uh, when I um, rinse felt I generally just sort of give it a gentle squeeze and get the water most of the water out that way and then roll it up in a towel afterwards just to get rid of some of the water uh, and then leave it to air dry uh, or lay it on a radiator um, just to dry and then um, we can move on to actually making our wreath with it so you can see quite how much this has shrunk now what we were aiming for was around 35 centimeters square along those lines so going down from 50 
to 35 centimeters. So yeah, we've got about slightly less on that side. So about 35, 35 by 33, something like that. But the important thing actually is to check it against your hoop. So that fits in quite nicely, I think. And obviously if it didn't, you could felt it a little bit more. Um, this is now felt and is finished, but you do have a bit of wriggle room as to how much you felt something. So um, you could keep going if um, it was still, you know, this, this wreath shape was still, um, seemed a bit too big for the hoop. Uh, but I think that's, that's worked out pretty well. So I'm gonna let this dry now and then we'll come back and work on our next stage. So here's our finished felt and hopefully you can see that those locking in fibres that we put on very last of all have kind of receded and disappeared a bit. Um, so you can still see all the, the bright colours and sparkle of the yarns and fibres uh, coming through. Um, some bits are covered up slightly more than others. We've got various bits of sparkle that are still sort of poking through. Um, but I think that all adds to the interest. So. Uh, it's quite a, a, a thick um, sort of pile of yarns and fibres we've got on there, which really gives it some texture. Um, so hopefully you can see that. Uh, so what we're going to do now um, is sort of prepare our felt ready for putting into the hoop. Uh, and the first thing we really want to do is iron it. You can see that there's a really crinkly, uneven texture to the um, felt. Now, I'm not here to uh, try and teach anybody how to do ironing, but I just thought it would be useful to show the difference between what the felt looks like um, when it hasn't been ironed um, compared to then when we do iron it. Um, you'll see it won't lose its, uh, its sort of crinkly organic texture, but it just sort of flattens uh, the felt fibres, the, the wool beautifully. So um, I've got my steam iron uh, ready on a wool setting and the big thing to remember is that we need to iron the felt on the reverse there's so much sparkly synthetic fiber on the front uh, on the front there that if we put the iron onto it they would melt onto the iron so uh, we're going to do it carefully uh, on the reverse so I'm just going to give it an iron and hopefully you'll see how ironing just kind of smooths down the fibres all rather beautifully um, and gives everything a sort of bit of a, a finished texture. Now the other thing that a steam iron can do which is great for felt um, is if you have got um, sort of uh, wobbly edges or bits that um, perhaps aren't quite shaped right. Uh, if you give your felt a, a good steam, um, then you can actually then just gently stretch um, parts of it to fit. So where we've got very wobbly edges, because remember we weren't worrying too much about the edges of this felt. Um, so where they're very wobbly, we can actually just stretch them slightly to make them straighter if that's if that's what we want. I mean, we don't particularly need it for this because we're going to be cutting these edges off. But it just shows what you can do. So there are even things you can do once the felt is already finished um, to sort of adjust the shape. So that's just straightening things up a little bit. As I say, I'm not gonna worry about it too much for the rest though. So, Giving it a good steam. So let's see what that looks like. So hopefully you can see that that's just smoothed the fibres of the wool um, nice and neatly, just to create um, just a a really nice sort of smoother surface. It hasn't lost its crinkle, um, but it just looks all a bit smoother and a bit neater. 
Um, now we could just go slightly around the edges here uh, if we want to, but uh, I think uh, we definitely need to lay off that part. Okay, so that's that's our piece ironed. Um, so next we're going to um, prepare the the hoop and uh, and get that ready. So now the felt is ironed and smooth, it's ready for the next stage, which is to fit it into the embroidery hoop. So I've switched on my glue gun for that to heat up, and I've sort of in auditioned which way around I like the hoop or I like the wreath looking best in the hoop. So which way is up? So I've worked that out. Uh, and I've also loosened the screw on the embroidery hoop so that we can get the fabric um, actually between it. Um, so I'm going to place the inner ring underneath the felt and the outer ring on top and just keep adjusting it until I've got it with the wreath circle pretty much central. Now we are going to be able to stretch the felt within the hoop as well so it doesn't have to be perfect but just kind of near enough. Um, so you'll see why we don't want felt that's too thick for this project because you're actually sandwiching it in between the two edges of the um, embroidery hoop. So that looks about right. I'm just going to tighten up the screw a little bit because um, they do have a bit of a habit of pinging off otherwise. So we'll just get it a little bit tight but not too tight, just enough to kind of keep it better in place and then just do a little bit of stretching of the felt around the edge. Hopefully you can see that. Just so that I can then try and get uh, the, the wreath circle looking as even as possible within the hoop. And then I'm gonna tighten the hoop screw a bit more. I'm going to try and tighten that as tight as it will go and there will come a point when it will be really hard then to stretch the felt anymore you know through that the sandwich of the two pieces of, of wood but this is quite helpful if if your circle of a wreath didn't quite end up as a circle, is a bit misshapen, you actually can sort of pull it into a nice pleasing shape. So we've obviously got to do something with all this excess felt now uh, that's around the edge. So what we're going to do is cut off an even, or to leave an even strip, which we're then going to fold um, inside and glue, and that will secure the whole thing. So I usually cut it with these quite narrow hoops um, sort of between about a centimeter and a half and so 15 mil and 18 mil um, so sort of three quarters of an inch maybe it's better to leave too much and then be able to cut off a bit more uh, than to cut off um, too little so start at a short edge so kind of around like that. So I'm going to start cutting just to create an even, even amount and then I'll be folding that in like that and gluing it. So you kind of want um, a little bit extra that goes beyond the hoop just to create a nice edge. So I'll cut right round and speed that up. So I've got my glue gun ready now and cut right around the edge. So what I'm going to do is just carefully glue on the inside of the ring and then press down the felt. Um, now with glue guns you have to sort of just glue a small amount each time otherwise it, it hardens solid and then you can't 
um, you know, get the, the felt to, to attach to it. So I'm just going to do small sections at a time and, uh, and then fold the felt over and go right round the ring in that way. So to start with, I've just done a little dab of glue um, in the sort of the open the gap in the rings just to flatten down that um, that top bit. Okay, so I'm going to go round. So let's do a little bit. So I've glued, well, four centimetres maybe, inch and a half or something, and I'm just going to hold it down. And that's just enough to make that stay. So, do the next bit. So I'm just going to keep going all the way around till I've done the whole of the inside. So I will speed that bit up. So that's the gluing finished and as you can see that creates quite a nice neat reverse for the felt. You do need some permanent way of securing the felt around that inner hoop uh, because if you just secure it by the outer ring alone um, well, it's it's just not really secure enough. It's um, not going to be enough as a sort of permanent fixing. So you do need to use something um, to um, secure the felt. So a glue gun really is, is great for that. But you could just try some kind of textile glue uh, if you don't have a glue gun. So that's our wreath circle uh, secure inside the hoop. Um, so now we're going to add, uh, we've got the bow to add and our hanging cord. Now actually I'm going to do the, I've, I've used a, uh, this red sparkly strip um, and I'm going to do that first because actually when you're trying to place the bow um, you're not actually sure until the wreath is hanging um, where the actual sort of bottom of the um, of the wreath will be. So actually it's, it helps if you've already got the um, hoop hanging to then be able to see where the actual proper bottom is where we're going to place the, uh, the bow. Although of course you could place it at the top um, of the wreath, you could obviously place it wherever you like. So all I've done is folded the 35 centimetres of cord in half and then put a knot at the end. I'm just going to snip off that loose bit and then go through where the screw is and that doesn't help from I can't quite show you from this angle but that gives us our obviously our means of of hanging the wreath up uh, if you don't want to obviously just hang it via you know that screw part which you could just hang over over a hook perhaps but it's quite nice having a um, you know an extra length to hang it from so then we're going to create the the wreath bow so I really am just going to out of this um, very lovely sparkly wired ribbon just literally create a bow as central as I can And you can make these obviously as big as you like. You could have, you know, really long um, sort of ends hanging off the end of the, the wreath if you wanted to. As I say, this is just a 50 centimeter length. But you can kind of have a play about with all of that. not very even in terms of the ends but I'm going to cut those to 
to size anyway. So I want to kind of get the bow quite tight so that we don't have any chance of it coming loose. But you can see how this wired ribbon gives a bit of structure so we can sort of flounce out the, the bow a bit. So the idea is it will look all a bit like that. It's all lovely and red and sparkly. It really matches the, the wreath, I think, on this one. So it'll go something like that and I'll worry about the ends once I've secured it. So I'm going to go away and attach that. You could use your glue gun to do it, um, but I think I prefer to just do a few stitches actually going through the very centre of the bow so um, that also will stop it going undone. So I'm just going to do a few stitches through the bow and through to the back of the um, hoop um, and get that, get that in place. Um, but to work out exactly where it goes I'm actually going to hold the, um, the hoop up from the hanging cord um, so that I know I've kind of got it you know, right at the, at the bottom. So I will go away and do that. And here's the finished festive felt wreath. So I've just added a few stitches through the centre of the bow, right through to the back of the felt to secure it, and then just trimmed the ribbon ends uh, and reshaped the bow. So it gives a really nice sort of 3D aspect to the, the hoop, um, which I think is rather nice. So that's now ready to hang. So just a few things I thought worth mentioning um, about this project. Um, in particular shrinkage, um, when I used Merino, as I've made a couple of versions uh, of this hoop in Merino um, as well as in bat fibre, and the Merino shrinkage was about 30%. When I used the Finwall bat fibre, probably about 25%, so it was a bit less. So um, that's why it's quite helpful having your hoop available to you as a guideline when you're getting towards the end of the uh, felting process. So when you're in that fulling stage at the end, which is where we were throwing the felt, um, that's the point where you can adjust how much you felt something to felt it a bit more or a bit less. And that's a really helpful thing, obviously, to, uh, to know in your wet felting, because sometimes when you do have a very specific end size you're trying to achieve, um, things don't always you know, work out exactly as you'd hoped. Um, your layout of the fibres might have just been that bit bit bigger, you know, so that you've ended up with a you know, the bigger circle, um, or you're using a different fibre and it reacts slightly differently and shrinks either more or less. So to be able to sort of adjust things as you go along is a, is a really important aspect of felt making. So as a result, um, because I found that my um, wreath circle was still a bit too, too big to look, um, sort of have a comfortable um, sort of, you know, standoff around the edge of the uh, the hoop. Um, I threw it probably another hundred or, or so times extra in the fin wall bat version um, just to get the shrinkage down a bit. Um, so so that's obviously something that you as a felt maker can deploy um, when you you know you're trying to fit something or get something down to a particular size. You have got flexibility there. The other way of getting a bit of flexibility with this particular project is to have a range of hoops at your disposal. These aren't expensive and you can actually find them in um, sort of quite a range of close sizes. You know, there's just a couple of centimetres um, in between sizes. So having a few available is quite handy because then if you find that, you know, the bigger hoop that you'd planned isn't quite right, you know, you might be able to use a different size hoop. And as I say, they're not expensive, very easy to find. So it's worth sort of having a range of them. So that gives you a bit of flexibility. And obviously you can scale up or down the size of your um, your felt and your you know your finished hoop as well. So you would just make either a larger or a smaller starting circle of these fibres at the beginning. Um, so you've got got lots of flexibility, um, you know, to make make a whole collection of these if you want to. Um, the only thing to remember, of course, with all of it is that just make sure you have plenty of excess going around the edge um, when you lay out your um, circle of fiber uh, fibers um, have plenty of excess so that you've got enough to fold over the edge um, and finish you know and secure it in your hoop 
So always err on the side of a bit more rather than um, too little, I, I think, when you're laying out uh, you know, that, that plain edge that you've got um, going around the, uh, the central circle. So I did um, say that I would leave you with some other ideas for how you could kind of adapt this. So sizes is one thing. Um, so is obviously colours of, of felt. Um, this one's sort of very red, pink, and, uh, purple and green. Um, you can also obviously use traditional colours like green and red. I've got a kind of wintry version here, you know, something in silver and gold would be lovely. Um, I also made, this is a merino version I made, uh, which uh, is in pink. So a sort of non-traditional colours, but you know, just as sparkly and you still uh, get the same sense of Christmas, I think, from that. Um, so changing up the colour um, is, you know, something you can do. Um, so is obviously changing up the size. Now, um, something that I've made quite a lot of um, is these smaller hoops, um, which are actually then small enough to be able to hang on your tree as a sort of Christmas bauble. Um, so that, that works quite nicely. So for that, instead of making the sort of uh, large square rectangle with a circular shape of, of the embellishment sparkly fibre in the middle, uh, with those ones um, what I've done is created a longer piece um, where I've kind of done it as a, a strip of fibres going across the centre and, um, and actually used two colours uh, within it and that gives you lots of flexibility actually for then creating smaller hoops where you can just sort of um, take a portion you know you can kind of play about look where, see where the hoop looks best and just take a portion of, of the piece um, and also you've got then if we go the other way up you know different color options as well so within just one piece of felt um, you can actually create quite a few of these and quite different ones uh, within the same from the same piece so um, making these smaller um, sort of hanging uh, tree ornaments is quite a nice thing to to do um, with your um, with your finished uh, felt that so that's another idea um, and obviously something else is is actually creating different sizes so these are all slightly different sized versions of the hoops um, so again, having a range of hoop sizes available is quite handy, particularly when, um, for instance, with this blue one, I'd made a bigger piece, but then didn't quite have enough to make another big one, but I did have enough for a little one. So you can kind of use up your smaller scraps as well, um, you know, with, with having more hoops available. So I hope that gives you an idea, actually, of how you can adapt the felted piece that we made in a slightly different way. So just by laying out the sparkly fibers differently, going obviously left to right in this version, um, to then create your hoops, you know, in a, in a, with a slightly different look, um, you know, not a specific wreath, but just, you know, this sort of pleasing sparkly patterns, you know, um, again, it all, all gives a very Christmassy feel. So um, that's our um, festive felt project uh, complete now. Thank you for watching. Um, do check all the details in the description uh, below for measurements. Everything you need will be there, uh, as well as the link to my other videos, particularly the one where I show you how to make a similar piece to this, um, but more with uh, feltable embellishments, whereas in this one we focus very much on non-feltable embellishments. Um, but that will give you an idea about uh, a version of this using merino fibre, which is a different layout. Um, uh, but in this sort of strip uh, strip of embellishments going across idea. Um, do like this video and subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed it and I do love to hear from you too so um, do please leave me a comment down below uh, and let me know what you think. So Merry Christmas and Happy Felting!